I give away free Steam games with every major video I do, and here's who won this week. The games available to receive are listed below. To enter, just leave a comment and have contact information on your profile. And now, on with the video. Hi folks, my name is Guillotine, and welcome to The Gaming Guillotine where I extol the excellent and execute the poorly executed. Speaking of poorly executed, is anyone else tired of how Nintendo keeps mishandling or neglecting their old properties? I've made no secret that I'm a fan of the Star Fox franchise. I'm also not ignorant to the fact that there are IPs that Nintendo has outright neglected over the years far worse than my favorite anthropomorphic Starfighter. F-Zero, Golden Sun, the Mother series, or even Chibi Robo. All of these games have faithful and devoted fan bases, but all have been starved for new entries for years, with some approaching or surpassing decades. Nintendo is an incredibly fickle entity. Whether or not they or another studio works on their beloved franchises, many times they need to keep a tight rein on things. However, I was heartened to see in the very least an article discussing intentions to revisit their GameCube library after the recent announcements of Pikmin and Super Mario RPG remasters. On that note, I wanted to take today to discuss one of the most polarizing games from the GameCube generation in one of their staple franchises. Well, I would say it's a staple franchise based off of things like their presence of Fox and Falco in Smash Brothers, but the last official Star Fox game let's not forget, I know I can't, was released in 2016. But let's get off my tangents for now. Star Fox Adventures was released in 2002 for the relatively young GameCube. I say relatively because the GameCube was barely a year old when it came out. Developed by Rare, it was a major departure for the franchise from its up-to-that-point traditional formula. Star Fox for the Super Nintendo and its Nintendo 64 sequel, inspiringly named Star Fox 64, were arcade-style and on-rail arena flight space shooters. Star Fox 64 is considered a seminal entry in the library of legendary Nintendo titles. Its makeup of finely crafted controls, iconic voice lines, the transition of Nintendo to full 3D graphics, a simple story, and an addicting gameplay loop that was perfect for one to two hour play sessions is commonly considered one of the greats of all video games to this day. But Star Fox Adventures wasn't initially intended on being a successor to that game. On its initial inception, Star Fox Adventures wasn't even a Star Fox game. Being developed under the operating title of Dinosaur Planet, it was being made by Rare as an entirely new intellectual property. By my understanding of the scenario, Shigeru Miyamoto was touring through the Rare offices, saw what they were developing, and said, I think that should be a Star Fox game. And lo was the path set. Now, a major salient criticism of Star Fox Adventures back in the day was that it wasn't really a space shooter like the previous games. To be fair, I can see how this would ruffle feathers, but I personally don't take umbrage with such factors, so long as a game is good. As to whether or not Star Fox Adventures is good, well, we'll get to that. Now, when starting up Adventures, it's worth reiterating that when it came out, we were barely approaching two years into the sixth console generation. This was when graphics were starting to get closer to photorealism, and developers were trying to show that off. I say all this to set up that audience members, myself included at the time, were taken aback by the spectacle that games were building up. And some games relished in that, which will be important later. Upon starting the game, you get the story setup of a blue fox girl, Crystal, investigating a planetary distress signal. Upon finding a ship supposedly behind that, we briefly take part in a, quote, traditional Star Fox segment, but from the back of a dinosaur that can breathe fire, followed by a brief on-foot exploration section. So far, so good. What wasn't good was the voice acting and story choice they made. This has not aged well at all. Don't get me wrong, the voice acting throughout most of the game is serviceable at best, but feels like the actors delivered the lines divorced from the context under which the character they played was speaking, then adding the awkwardness of being made to speak in a language that sounds entirely unnatural or lacking in flow that would match one that you naturally speak gives a certain degree of cringeworthiness that is very difficult to look past, especially when you realize that the language changes back to English when proper nouns come up. Of a brief side note, unless I'm mistaken, there's a translator app somewhere online for this game. It's actually a pretty simple cipher swap. It just replaces letters with other letters. But anyway, back to the voice acting. So, yeah, the voice acting is bad. 
It's fair to say back in the day it was less of an issue because, let's face it, as a kid your standards are much lower. I mean, also to be fair, video games have progressed a lot in 20 years, but like the game, after playing for about a half hour, let's put the sloppily made up language aside. After the ship encounter and cutscene, Blue Foxy Boobs ends up at a temple and must gather a spear in order to try and help the planet. In the process, she's attacked and Crystal ends up in a crystal. We then cut away to the main characters aboard the Great Fox. It looks to have fallen into disrepair, and Fox seems to be wasting time while browsing on Reddit. Falco also seems to be missing. That last thing actually gets explained in an expanded lore manga that the West never officially received. Yes, Star Fox has expanded lore, albeit limited. Anyways, Team Star Fox is short on money and aims to fix that after being told to save Dinosaur Planet by General Pepper and his Lonely Hearts Club band. On his way to the Dinosaur Planet, we participate in another classic Star Fox level, with classic being put between the largest quotation marks that I can muster. It's basically a husk of its former glory. The game lacks any real detail or discernible scenery to separate it from later levels. The game throws in spacecraft and mines with no legitimate reason, and to beat the level, all you have to do is fly through a gold ring. Quality of its design aside, this flight level is bad for many reasons. First is that it sets up an expectation for flight levels that are going to be far more prevalent than they actually are. In reality, save for the final boss fight, the flight levels serve as little more than minigames to act as a means to mix up the pace of the game. Secondly, they lack any sense of epic scale or real challenge. So long as you get all the golden rings necessary, you can otherwise get through without ever firing a single shot. Thirdly, anytime you have to go to space to transition to another level, you have to do the same flight course for that level every single time, including the first starting level. Given how lacking in challenge it is, I literally would put the controller down after getting the single ring needed and let the game go about wasting my time until I was back on the planet. Finally, because of that first level, the lack of real challenge, and the almost routine process of level transitioning, it diminishes the importance of the game and its mechanics to the point that it becomes jarring and creates an incredible jump in difficulty when it turns out the final boss is also a flight level. There's one more thing regarding that, but I'll get to that when it's time to discuss the ending. Once on Dinosaur Planet, we do some on-foot exploring and learn some more about the mechanics, because this is where we learn that this game is more akin to The Legend of Zelda than Star Fox, in spite being called Star Fox. One of the more important mechanics we get acquainted to here is combat. We find Crystal's staff and are invited to beat up a handful of Sharp Claws. Starting off, the combat feels alright. However, what I wasn't expecting was that as far as one-on-one -on -one combat and combos went, this is by and large all you are getting throughout the entire game. Mash A until the enemy is dead. If they block, stop mashing A for a split second, then go back to mashing A. No block or parry, no light or heavy option, just some slightly different animations for spamming A. Later in the game, you can incorporate some of your staff power-ups into combat, but that often leaves you open to other attacks and it doesn't slot well into an active duel. Actually, speaking of poor controls and staff power-ups, that reminds me! As you go through the game, and as obstacles become present, you unlock power-ups and abilities for your staff for traversal. These can range from the ability to shoot fireballs or streams of ice, to unleashing a shockwave on the ground around you, to the traversal power-up of the rocket staff. Most of these work alright in the context where they are needed for puzzles or traversal, but a problem I encountered was when you need to switch to the aiming mode. Since there were fewer established game design fundamentals back in the day, I can see why this might have been deemed appropriate for the time, but let me say this. The aiming mode for the fireball shot is f***ing terrible. It's almost like someone put mouse acceleration on a thumbstick. It actually ended up being the source of one of the biggest challenges and problems in the game, which I'll come back to later. Continuing your exploration, you eventually come across Tricky. In the plot, he's the prince of one of the tribes you have to work with to save the planet. Mechanically, he's a tool that allows you to find secrets and access blocked off routes. Personally, I find him to be an insufferable pain in the ass, and he's not the only one. Immediately after you save him, you gain access to a universal translator that Slippy was working on, allowing you to be saved from the pain of the awkward made-up language on top of the bad voice acting. The main problem with now being able to communicate with everyone is that Fox now comes across as a tremendously self-centered or sarcastic asshole. The shark claws dropped it when they attacked me. Maybe it'll come in use somewhere. Okay, enough already. Can I just get on with it? And these aren't isolated moments. Fox is quipping or snipping all the way up until right before the final boss fight. Like, right after he saves Crystal and she takes her staff back to try and stop the big baddie, he gets all indignant because she didn't immediately drop to her knees and give praise to her mighty savior. Oh, thank 
it's for nothing. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be standing here at all. Excuse me, if I consider shooting a planetary destruction level threat more important than sucking your dick! But even when Fox isn't sounding like an entitled or obnoxious douchebag, a lot of the dialogue just comes across as awkward or delivered while being completely disjointed from the tone or mood that is taking place. For example, when liberating a captive from prison, they make introductions that sound like they came out of a young children's program on etiquette. It wouldn't be so bad if you could skip the cutscenes. The problem is, you can't. Like, almost any of them. Even the stupid little cutscenes that take place when you unlock a tool item or a plot necessary MacGuffin. In fact, it will sometimes make you watch multiple item unlocking scenes back to back, while I'm screaming desperately for a skip function. If there were extremely difficult boss encounters, I likely wouldn't have been willing to suffer through them for more than one or two attempts. Mercifully, the game's overall difficulty is rather anemic. The best way I can describe the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is unchallenging but tedious. Something that pairs well with something to split your attention with, like a podcast or a documentary to play in the background. As established, the combat is basic and can be managed with a single button. The puzzles are fairly easy and boil down to interact with all the items in a room that you can, or use a specific consumable item that you can acquire almost always a single room away if not in the same room. Additionally, you're rarely more than 30 seconds away from a health pickup that can respawn. Every so often, though, there's a jump in difficulty. Something tied to hyper-focused reactions, or wrestling with the control scheme itself, which I suppose leads me to the perfect opportunity to gripe more specifically about the fireball aiming from earlier. Late in the plot, like the world before the final boss sequence, you have to free a Brachiosaurus from bondage by shooting four targets in rapid succession. Emphasis on rapid succession. You see, if you don't shoot all of them in time, then they start to revert in the order that you hit them in. This wouldn't be the biggest problem if there was a lock-on function or even the thumbstick functioned like a standard aim function in any shooter made after Halo. The problem being, the C-stick, what you use to aim in the necessary mode, is unreasonably sensitive, and it reverts if you let go. So you need almost superhuman precision to aim quickly. It was this sequence that broke me, and since I was already so close to the end, I opted to just load my save from years ago to play the sequence leading up to the final boss. Thank you, past me. That was apparently far more tolerable of bullshit. The somewhat random spikes in difficulty weren't just tied to bad controls, though. The Krozoa Temple tests fluctuated wildly from temple to temple. The first one, which you play while controlling the furry community sex icon, is borderline preschool follow the hit em item challenges. Another is just beat all the bad guys in this room. But the Trial of Fear Temple, I'd argue, is unreasonable, not for the mechanical challenge, but for the fact that if you fail and have to retry, even if you manually save right before it, you have to navigate the tedious platforming course before going at it again. Actually, a brief aside, I am so glad that autosaving has become so ubiquitous amongst modern design because Star Fox Adventures doesn't have it. I won't bemoan it too much because this was a different era, but it led to one garment-rendingly frustrating moment that I had when my power went out during one of the many thunderstorms I've been experiencing lately. Isn't climate change great, but I digress. Every so often there was a strangely demanding timed platforming challenge. I beat each one on the first time, but it was always by the skin of my teeth. But the final difficulty spike is the final boss fight. Spoilers ahead for the 20-something-year-old game. So it turns out the big bad behind everything was, once again, Andros. Evidently, death isn't even enough to ensure Andros isn't an issue anymore. Loosely recalling the final exposition dumps, Andros's spirit refused to pass on and found the Krozoa spirits on Dinosaur Planet and concocted a plan to use General Scales and the spirits to resurrect himself. Fine, whatever. It's a mean to force more continuity into the established Star Fox universe. What's not fine is the fact that the final boss fight is that space shooter flight section I mentioned before. You know, the between-level mini-games that were more of a pace-breaker and required minimal to no serious attention? Well, I hope you honed your skills in those stages, because you're gonna have to work for it if you didn't. To illustrate the point that the game poorly implemented the flight stages, it was completely unnecessary to use, and I completely forgot about the game's barrel roll mechanic. Sidebar, yes I know the proper flight term is the aileron roll, I'm just going with Star Fox tradition. Getting back on topic, this move is 100% necessary to beat Andros, otherwise it's a fairly traditional Star Fox final boss fight in a game that entirely didn't earn it. I mean, why couldn't Andros resurrect into some giant biped that we could defeat on the ground? The impression I get is, once again, a game that for 
forced continuity to either meet Miyamoto's request to make it a Star Fox game, or to placate the fan base so they'd only burn down a small bit of the Rare development offices instead of most of it. However, by forcing continuity and splitting design between these disparate elements, I'd wager it took away from the possibility of more engaging combat, more varied boss fights, and the ability to have a focused and polished end product. Star Fox Adventures is, in my opinion, a mediocre Legend of Zelda clone that should have leaned harder into what made those games great, and for f say, gotten better direction for voice acting. I contend that the main reason that Adventures has any merit to talk about is because of its lineage. Rare, while not as prolific today, was a legendary studio, and Star Fox is still instantly recognized amongst Nintendo fans. If both those factors were not present, would Star Fox Adventures still be worth talking about, or would it simply be another Zelda clone, doomed to occupy the headspace of niche communities? Well, let's look at some positives or other aspects that may be looked on in kinder light. Firstly, it did open up the Star Fox series to a narrative beyond itself, which was carried on by both Assault and Command. A chance for deeper or more epic stories, or character-given struggles. Too bad the most recent endeavors seem to be ignoring or retconning this, so net neutral, I suppose. What else? Well, it sold relatively well, not in the millions of copies territory, but enough to reach the Player's Choice label, and... And that... That may be it. You're forgetting the lore. The what? The lore! The narrative that actually ties Star Fox Adventures into so many other aspects of Nintendo's properties. I have never heard about this. Elaborate. Okay, do you recall the Giga League from a few years back? Uh, yeah. In that league, they discovered volumes of expanded universe details for all their franchises, otherwise known as the E-Logs. Data miners made a whole website cataloging Star Fox's Nintendo Multiverse Network. The Star Fox franchise was designated as number 621 in the data they found. Really? Seriously, just Google any character from Adventure and E621 and you'll be gifted with so much to open your mind to. Take Crystal for example. Alright, well, I'll see for myself, I guess. Told you it would open your mind.